You vote with your fucking money, man. It, it's like, it's that simple. What is the fucking point of voting for anyone? Hello there from Bedford. How are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by the mighty Kraken, the best place to buy, sell and trade Bitcoin. I'm your host, Peter McCormack. And today I've got a pretty special interview. I've got Keith Levine, founder member of The Clash, and we're going to talk about punk and Bitcoin. But before that, I do have a message from my amazing show sponsors. So first up today, let's talk about Bitcoin security and specifically Casa. They are the best in Bitcoin security. So come on, how seriously are you taking your Bitcoin security? Have you prepared for every eventuality? I hadn't. There were definitely holes in my personal Bitcoin security, something I'd been nervous about for a while, especially since an interview I did with Lop a while back in my Beginner's Guide to Bitcoin when we were talking about security and OPSEC. So when it came time to switch things up, I turned to Casa as they are the best in the industry for this. With Casa, you can protect yourself from personal mistakes, losing or compromised devices, personal attacks and lost seeds. They really have thought of everything. And I found that out when I went through their key ceremony. And now I've got so much peace of mind using their product. And with their gold product, you can get started for as little as $10 a month. And they are offering a one month free trial so you can get that at trial.keys.casa. Do not regret this at a later date. We've heard so many stories of people messing up and losing their Bitcoin. You've got plenty of reasons just to try out Casa now. So give it a shot. If you want to find out about their other products, you want to head over to keys.casa, which is K-E-Y-S dot C-A-S-A. Also, let's talk about Sportsbet. Have you checked out sportsbet.io yet? They are the best for online gambling. And you know what? They accept Bitcoin. And Why? because they're badasses. And are you enjoying football being back now? I am, even though we don't have crowds. It's just great to have some football back. And with the season coming to close, we've got the cup final coming and the Champions League before it all ends. And then we can get back to normal next season and watch Liverpool dominating again. And if you do love the football, there is no better place to have a wager on it than with sportsbet.io. And of course, they have promotions galore to make things all the more exciting. For new customers to get you started, they have prepared a generous offer. If you win four bets in a row across four separate matches during one week, after your first deposit at sportsbet.io, then they're going to give you a 10 MBTC free bet on top of that. If you want to find out more, head over to sportsbet.io forward slash promotions. Sportsbet.io is S-P-O-R-T-S-B-E-T dot I-O. Okay, on to the show today. And this one's a bit different. Keith Levine is a punk rock OG and he's a founding member of both The Clash and Public Image Limited. And a couple of months ago, I got an amazing email from Keith explaining to me how he is into Bitcoin and how he's a massive fan of the show and has been listening to it for quite a while. And then he asked me if I'd heard of The Clash and obviously I laughed. And then he sent me a mug for my tea, which is calling me a mainstream cunt. (laughs) So thanks for that, Keith. But it's been really great getting to know him over the last couple of months. And obviously, with him being a Bitcoin, I was like, come on, Keith, come on the show. Let's talk about punk. Let's talk about Bitcoin. And it turned out to be one of my favorites. Now, Keith is really cool, and he truly gets Bitcoin. So it's great to get into that and even cooler to hear about the early days of punk and similarities between the punk movement and what's happening with Bitcoin today. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this show as much as I enjoyed making it. If you've got any feedback, you know you can reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Outside of that, make sure you check out Defiance. I've got an amazing show that went live this week with Store Inside the World of Porn. Please do go and check that out. That's at defiance.news. And as I said, if you want to reach out to me, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Morning, Keith. How are you? Uh, great. Great. Great to talk to you. I'm fine. How are you, yeah. Peter? You, you're doing good. well, man. Hard work. Yeah, doing man. well. Good to talk to you again. So uh, a couple of months ago, I get an email in my inbox and it says, uh, hi, I'm a listener of your show. I can't remember the exact words, but I'm a listener of your show. My name's Keith Levine. I, I was in a, I was one of the founding members of a band called The Clash. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. And I was like, the fuck? <laughs> Have I heard of The Clash? What's right. I, heard of the Clash? You're, you're, I know you. You're Metallica. You're Metallica, aren't you? Well, I like a bit of old punk. Okay. I, mean, I, I was always into the hardcore stuff, so... Yeah, 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 yeah. That was yeah. when, for me, that was when it was done to death. Um, you had a situation where, um, you know, really this stems from 1974. This all kind of kicked off in 76, but quite funny. Um, really similar to the situation now. you got Margaret Thatcher and before, I can't remember who, don't care, uh, didn't then. Three-day weeks, man. Power cuts. All this kind of stuff, yeah. 
no work for anyone. Mm-hmm. It, nobody even expected the, it. It was just normal. Everything was so boring. Uh, uh, the best tech we had was color TV, you know, like uh, the big news was a new channel. We were using fucking telephones, man, uh, like landlines. I don't know how we got anything together. Very interesting thing there on uh, organic networks and uh, sorting out the organic network to go with the tipping point of a certain network we might be talking about soon um, in the show. So essentially, I guess it was austerity. You know, we didn't, we weren't philosophical. We weren't particularly intellectual. We just knew by feel that everything was fucked. And the Bitcoin of the time was being in a band when you think about it, you know, the only way round was to just do your own thing. You know, we call it low time preference now, you know, but we had no choice. I mean, we had no choice. We didn't even have zero hour contracts and all these bastard corporations. You know, it was just kind of, it was draconian. It, it, we inherited the tail end of the Victorian age. Okay. And we also, we're inheriting things like Lindsay the pool on top of the pops and just the most ridiculous things were going on. Now I love prog rock, but it had to stop. It all had to stop. So it was like we set off a bomb, you know, and uh, the only way to go was the wrong way anyway, but the way it was going. So we just said, fuck everything. And, did the bands, you know, did the Clash, I mean, you know, the Pistols were first. There were a few other bands around that were really in on this, you know, um, that aren't really classed as punk, that had a lot to do with the music and were just right in there. Um, what ba- what bands were they? Well, you know, in my mind, I mean, you'll get a different array of bands every time you talk to me. In my mind at the moment, I'm, I'm just thinking of the time and, you know, like Elvis Costello was a really, really good fucking band. You know, not necessarily singing about anything too heavy, but all this stuff really counted. Um, Patti Smith was around, which really counted. So you're coming off the tail end of this kind of interim between prog and uh, this kind of acceptance of, look, time to get real. We have to get real that, you know, they don't give a fuck about us. We don't give a fuck about them. We just got to move forward. How, how old were you at the time when this was all going on? When, like I, was, when I was doing, well, I would have been uh, 18, you know, because it, it, it was sort of the tail end of 74, 75. Okay. I, I would have been 20 and 77. So 19, 18, 19. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and what was it like, like when you were coming to, cause obviously there's just a couple of years before I, I was born, right? What was, you were coming out of school. Everyone hated Margaret Thatcher, right? Yeah. A lot of austerity at the time. Like talk to me about what, what, what the kind of feeling was in the country. Was that during the minor strikes? Yeah, that was all going on. General feeling at the time was everything was fucked. Okay. But it was yeah. our, our first time around. So it's like, is it always like this? Maybe it's always like this, you know, uh, you know, we're watching like stupid stuff on TV, like the American dream stuff and this Fonzie and all this crap. But for me, you know, Blue Peter was the warning for the news, you know, and the news, I just always knew they were lying. I always knew they were lying. Uh, it used to give me this feeling, um, you know, uh, I mean, everything that was going on there now is so obvious today. I think it was so obvious then, but it's that, you know, that kind of blind spot thing, you know, they called it being red pilled. You know, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And then you start unraveling the layers. So we were doing that. There was no tool. And you know the tool mm. I'm talking about. There was no tool at the time. So the only thing. Punk rock. Was, your tool was your guitar, man. Well, that was the thing. Like I said, you know, that was the thing. And, uh, you know, did I want to be Eddie Van Halen, who was kind of around at the time? Uh, but, uh, did I want to be Jimmy Page or Jimmy Hendrix or any of those kind of things? No, no way. You know, not because it was hard, because I could play like that. Okay. I chose not to do that as a letter of intent. You know, we don't copy. I mean, I've had a little bit of anger post punk from where a lot of these guys went, the way they came in you know, and then where they went. It's like thinking like Roger Veer was cool when you first found out about him. Then you realize, oh dear, oh dear, Roger Veer. Yeah. You know, and the same thing with certain people. I don't really want to name. It's not that important, but I'm just saying like a lot of people went in there kind of had 1% uh, of a result 
and then just went the way they were saying was fucked, you know, and became Bono or something. I might have mentioned him before, but he's just the poster boy for the virtue signaling. Uh, we are the world crew, you know? Yeah. So let, let me ask you. All right. So obviously the, it was a pretty fucked time. I know a lot of people didn't like Margaret Thatcher. I, I know the minor strikes were, were a pr- I don't know the dates of the minor strikes. I know that not, was a not pretty a bad time. H- historically, I know it was. but And it feels like it, right now we're at a pretty, pretty kind of fucked time. But there does feel like periods in between. Like, I don't know, maybe like, I mean, I wasn't a Tony Blair fan, but it, it didn't feel like the country was in a terrible state. Yes, he took us into a stupid war we don't want to go into. But it feels like now we're at like the precipice of something terrible do you, you haven't lived through it all for you has it just been the same all the way or do you feel like no, now i've never seen anything like this but what freaks me out about it even more is it isn't heavy enough okay? right it was heavier when when we were kids it was a given right but you had all these old school guys that were still you know coming from the second world war you know you didn't want to upset them because you had to respect the fact that Look, we know they got conned, but they did fight for the country and they believed in what they did. And, uh, you know, I, not everybody was as mindful as me about certain things. I know you'd be like that. Um, mm. You know, you respect where they were coming from and you feel bad. But the last thing you want to do, the last thing you want to tell a hero is actually, you're not a hero, mate, because the whole thing was a load of bollocks. It was all about money and you got fucked. And this has been going on now pretty much for two to 10,000 years. You know, mm. I'd rather respect the guy because of what he did, yeah? All these old school guys around, it was such a completely different atmosphere, whereas now we're coming from the watered-down fiat fucking art, music, everything, fiat food, you know, just fiat conversations, or or another word for fiat would be fake, you know, fake everything, and it's been going on actually since punk, and in, in the 80s, we imported everything that was fucked from America, you know? Uh, whether America was great or not, okay, I've had great times there, and I've seen great potential there. And you know it's like, Peter, it's like loads of different countries anyway. You know, yeah. like New York. I love America, it over there. I, I love it there too. But if, you, if you've been around there, you, you know, like me, it isn't you, – you go – you love America because you see this kind of big – like – you just get wowed by what people talk about in America, and then you go there, and it's just the people, right? Because you can go to one state and meet a group of people, and then you go to another state, you meet a completely different group of people who speak the same language, but they're just the people are brilliant. And everywhere you go, everyone's welcoming, everyone's nice. They, they just get it ruined by the politics. It's, it's the politics that ruins it and the kind of international affairs, but I, I love it out there, man. Yeah, and it's so amazing, and, and it, it takes – you have to experience to understand, God, Americans, I get it. They're coming from a completely different place. They, of course, they're like this, but you can't learn about that through telly or being into America. You have to have done, done this. Um, let me ask you. Yeah. Um, what was the atmosphere like in America recently? Right. So when was the last time? Well, I haven't been there since coronavirus. That's the thing. So well, I haven't been there since George Floyd. Floyd you know. But last time I was there, I mean, I've seen a gradual change. So a good example of this is going to San Francisco. I first went to San Francisco in, when did I go there? So I was 30, 11 years ago, and I okay. loved it. Beautiful city. And every time I I went, it's just been getting slightly worse. To the last time I went there, I ended up I was going for a jog and ended up in the Tenderloin, which is an area which is where a lot, a lot of the homeless and drug addicts congregate. But also, it you get a lot of people who've clearly got mental health issues as well as drug problems. Yeah, wandering wandering the streets, yelling at people, yelling at nothing. But it's almost like if it was London, these people would be on Oxford Street, Regent Street, Bond Street, in Piccadilly Circus which you don't really get. You get beggars in London, but you don't really have people with mental health issues just walking up and down Oxford Street yelling at people. But you have that in San Francisco, and it's it's really sad, and it's quite desperate. So that where, conversely, the first time I went to New York was the year after September the 11th, and there were certain places you couldn't go. Like, I went to Brooklyn, and I had to be careful. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what I was doing, and, you know, the last couple of times I've been to New York, I've actually stayed in Brooklyn because Brooklyn's changed so much. New York's become a lot safer. Like I felt safer there. People from there might tell me different, but that's how two two places have changed. But what I have felt is, for, I've got a lot of friends in America, 
and there is this political divide that I've not experienced before. Before it was like, oh, he was, he, you're Republican, oh, you're Democrat, and yeah, they'll, they'll argue po- politics. Now there's full-on hatred. There is this fine, This it's like, and it's not even just Democrats versus Republicans. It's Trump versus anti-Trump. That's what it's become. And there's like this war going on now and this tension around it that I've not witnessed before. And, and that's not to say people didn't like presidents. I've met Republicans who didn't like Obama. I've met Democrats who didn't like George Bush. But this, it, it's, it's almost captivated the world. It's, it's very odd. It's very odd. It's anger, isn't it? Yeah. It's anger. Yeah. And dare I say, ignorance. Um, you know, the, how do you wipe the facade away for them and stop them getting more angry? You know, I mean, in general and obviously with, with Bitcoin. Um, but it's also, it's like who you vote for, Keith, right? So we had the UK well, election. You vote with your fucking money, man. It, it's like, yeah, it's, exactly. It's that simple. What is the fucking point of voting for anyone? You know, well, and I've never voted. There you go. I know you didn't vote this time around. I yeah. get why you were voting, but I knew, I knew from punk times that this is bollocks and this is futile and they're both the same company. And, and it's, uh, mm. so for me, I can, you know, I carry a lot of anger around about that, but now it's just like, I mean, doesn't Bitcoin decode and confirm so many things you felt and thought? Like I've heard you say, shit, I never really questioned money. I, I knew what you did to get it and it would be in the bank. And if it ran out, then I couldn't do any more things. Uh, but luckily, yeah. you know, and we're all two paychecks away from, you know, and this whole thing that gets uh, outlined uh, or polarized when you start understanding we've actually been conditioned not to save and it would be crazy to save. And anytime we make a, get a result, we're going to blow it. We're just going to, sort of live high for three and a half months and then go back to the usual bollocks we're used to. But we've been conditioned to do it that way. We've been conditioned to think there is no, there is no future. Dare I say it? Yeah. We were saying it then. um, But my thing was that, that, that my thing was that was bollocks, but it was a fantastic meme for the time, you know, anarchy Mm -hmm. in the UK, you know, you know, the difference between being an anarchist and being anarchic and, being anarchic is enough. You know, we want to avoid violence. Now is the time for punk rock more than ever. Okay. And luckily we've gone from punk that could only be what it was to the cypher punks. And it's like the gold and Bitcoin guys. They actually fundamentally want the same thing. I know. And, and we want the same thing. And my thing is, you know, oh gosh. Is it a little bit difficult? Oh, was it hard downloading Bitcoin car? I know it's fucking hard. It's fucking money, man. Like, you know what? It might be worth it. Well, so, yeah, but the thing is, right, you had punk, and we're going to dig into that because I want to know some of the bands. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, oh, you'll get you, it. Sorry. But you had bands. You had the bands, right? You had the people who didn't give a fuck. The problem is, it's also, is like, as everything else has got watered down, so it's music. Like, I'm into some heavy metal bands, right, who've got some, like, cool attitudes. But the kind of bands that are out there, like, are really saying important stuff. There isn't many. Like, I was so glad. I'd, I'd love to know what you think of Rage Against the Machine because I was so glad – they reformed last year because I've always loved their energy and attitude. I know they're socialists, and I know socialism doesn't work with Bitcoin. I'm not even aware of them, but tell me more. You don't know Rage Against the Machine? I'm not even aware of them. Uh, Well, they're like uh, Rage Against the Machine. I tell you, they did this really cool thing once. They went outside Wall Street and and started playing a song, and they shut down Wall Street. Because, look, they recognize that. Yeah, they Rage Against the Machine recognize the problems in the system. I don't agree with their solutions because their solutions are socialism, and I'm not a socialist, right? But I just feel like we don't have, we don't really have punk rock. And by the way, I don't always think punk is just loud guitars and screaming, right? I think punk is also an attitude. It's way way beyond that now. It can be anything. It It can be be art, right? It can be classical music. Yeah. It's going to be artwork, and it is artwork. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, punk is definitely a, a frame of mind. And really, all the, the cypherpunks, okay, just so fucking hip and so fantastic, so educated. And that's the difference. But why wouldn't they be? You know, it's now. You know, now we have the tech. Uh, 
you know, I, I was very uh, impatiently waiting for tech. I could see a lot of tech coming. We got fucked by the, the digital things going from analog to digital. Then we got fucked by web 1.0 with NASA. Then we got fucked by YouTube. Now I can't even put my, I can't even put my own thing up on YouTube. I'll get a takedown or it won't even get up. Yeah. Because of ID, whatever it's called, you know, so web 2.0 just emulated exactly in software, the same oppression, worse even, you know, it was just made to measure. Okay. So, you know, th th there's been certain visions of Web 3.0. Okay. Lots of different, but really, I, I just think Bitcoin, the Bitcoin protocol is Web 3.0 and it is buildable. Um, you know, people don't realize that there's Bitcoin core and there's Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the currency. Uh, people don't realize that Bitcoin's the only cryptocurrency for one of a much better expression that has the monetary policy. Um, even Ellen Brown says Bitcoin isn't money of the people, it's mine. She obviously doesn't understand proof of work, but she's so fucking amazing. You know Ellen Brown, don't you, Peter? No, I don't. Well, uh, I, I may, probably yes, should. I probably do. Remind uh, me. Let me check uh, her out. Ellen you, Brown. You may, yeah, you really should. Uh, you, you may not have spoken to her, but you know of her. I know oh, you yeah, do. yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, you Web know Web yeah, yeah. yeah. Web Debt would be, uh, you know, uh, shout out to Web Debt. Anyone listening that isn't always listening to this show, um, should check out the Bitcoin standard and web of debt. Fantastic polarizing contrast between the two things. Yeah. Obviously a little bit bullish on Bitcoin here. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to go, um, let's come back to that. It's a tool of fucking punk rock. Bro. <laughs> That's why. Well, look, we're going to come back to that. Cause I want to know, I definitely want to know how you found it, but come on, take me back. Right. So I want to take me back. Back to the late seventies. You're fucked off. Everything's shit. You've got a guitar. How does like the yeah. clash come to be? How did that? How did that happen? Talk me through that. Okay, you're gonna. I mean, um, I've probably told this story once or twice, right? But I want to hear it. Fantastic, telling Peter McCormack this. Um, okay, there was a thing in the air. There were loads of bands. There were bands like Eddie and the Hot Rods. There were bands like the Patti Smith Band. Uh, shit was happening in England. Uh, Ding Walls was changing. The Ramones popped in. All this kind of thing. And you had the Pistols, which was, as far as I was concerned, the best band around and the thing that focused me. Okay. Um, and there was a guy called Malcolm McLaren, who you probably heard of, oh, and a yeah. guy called Bernard, Bernard Rose, who you may not have heard of. Um, we used to work together, had a shop called Let It Rock, which um, half thought to be in sex. On, uh, they were both on the King's Road. And... Uh, Malcolm went away for a couple of weeks and Bernard looked after the pistols and not too many people really know this, but he, he started talking to John and saying, you know, John, you're doing stepping stone here. Okay. Like, what do you really think? How do you really feel? You know, and out of that was rendered things like, uh, pr uh problems, pretty vacant. Can't think of any, any others right now, but it, it was amazing progress. And, uh, I don't know what happened. They had an argument. Bernard was looking for a band. I was looking for the shit and had sort of naturally migrated to West London, met Mick Jones, met the West London scene, all those guys, all the guys that would be, maybe you don't know about punk, you know, but just all, all the usual suspects that ended up in the damned and generation X and whoever, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, <laughs> then we've got like velvet jackets and long hair and stuff. Yeah. And you know, I was in the transition too. I, I was, I was just as guilty. Yeah. But anyway, pretty much we end up looking like this, like I'm looking, um, or thereabouts. And, uh, you know, we wanted another band. It was like, it wasn't like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Okay. I, I think the Beatles and the Stones is like Bitcoin and Ethereum, but, um, this was just necessary. And we we're looking for another band uh, and, we're putting it together and it's a bit Rolling Stones. And then I find Joe Strummer getting out of the one on one which is the most popular pub band. So I had to say to this guy, dude, I want you to leave the most popular pub, most sex successful pub band in West London to join us. We haven't even got a name yet, but you should be with us. And I actually talked him into it. Remind me, where, where's the one one Oh, the one one ers was, um, just a band in West London. Oh, I um, thought it was a venue. I thought it was a venue. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Uh, but I think they were named after 101 Chippenham Road or something. Because I saw, you know, um, but... did you know the band The Gallows? 
I know of them, but I didn't know them. Yeah, yeah. So they're a more recent kind of punk band. I'm sure I saw them at a venue called that. But well, what was Joe Strummer like? Joe Strummer was really actually very, very real. Uh, he was really genuine, really passionate, really romantic. And he was really, he's like, um, I always imagine him on a Greyhound bus, old school Greyhound bus with a shabby guitar case and an acoustic inside. You know, um, you know that picture of Bob Dylan? Highway 61 revisited mm-hmm. where he's got, you know, I kind of imagine Joe like this, like lost American, you know, he, and, and so he just was all in on this. He was a little bit older than us, which I used, I leveraged against him to motivate him. Yeah. <laughs> and it fucking worked, bro. And like, uh, so what happened was, um, next thing I know, there's this fantastic band and the only one that doesn't fit is me. And me and Bernard used to talk about shit all the time. You know, this is when we started dropping the model. You know, the whole thing was the fucking record companies, right, were the central banks of the music business. Still are, even worse. You know, the usual suspect. I won't even mention the cunt's name, you know. So, you know, now we didn't know that. We didn't intellectualize that. Oh, I know what's going on. We just did it by feel. And when we had them sucking our cocks pretty much to give us money, of course we did it, okay? And we managed to pull that up from just going into places and just saying, fuck everything, you know, and doing really good music. And when I say really good music, um, you know, maybe Bach wouldn't agree or Mantovani or even the guys from Toto. But the reason it was so good was because it was so disruptive. Did you, um, I, I, did you get to play any shows with the clash? Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I did a, a few key ones. Um, and uh, I, we knew I was going to leave, and then I chose not to do the Rainbow, which would have been the like gateway gig for them to be like, this, this is it, you know. Once you've mm-hmm. done the Rainbow, it's pretty good, yeah. What, and what, I ended up trying. Yeah, go. On. What were those early gigs like? Really, really fast, intense. You know, like gigs out of London, uh, the Sex Pistols and the Clash. We do that a lot, uh, and it was like really Malcolm. I think was testing us and Bernard were testing the situation. And, uh, you know, so, and we got to playing and be better. I mean, the first gig we did was in our own studio, which was pretty cool, pretty exclusive. So, um, exclusive in, in, in a good way, not in that horrible virtue of you ain't on the list, you're not coming in way, but more like invite, you know, we just invite the right people. Um, very, very small scene. A great example of, it doesn't take a very high percentage to propagate a change. You saw this with uh, the suffragettes and the women's movement, the women's vote. You're going to see this. Well, you know, I don't like talking about BLM because of the other crew. I don't want to promote them. So, but, you, you know. All right. So, like, you were there in the early days of the Clash. You did the early gigs. Obviously, it was exciting. You know, you're friends with the Sex Pistols. Tell, 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 yeah. what, what was Johnny like back then, Johnny Rotten? really great i mean here's the thing okay he's not my favorite person now i'm not going to be too disrespectful about him now okay yeah he, he is who he is yeah um but when it like he was just like do you want to hear how he ended up being recruited into the pistols yeah tell me you don't know that story no, I don't know. I, I, here's the thing Peter. i feel like everyone knows this shit but you don't so great well, i might do so, when you tell me about other people's okay other people might not quite funny um, the best thing I do is give you an image of the King's Road, you know, the bit, the curvy bit and what have yeah, you. Yeah. So he's walking down the road and he's got his t shirt on. It says, it's a Pink Floyd t shirt and it says, I hate Pink Floyd. Yeah. <laughs> um, fucking great. Yeah. <laughs> and we're seeing this guy around and he kind of dresses all right and, you know, just interesting guy. He was just fucking funny. Yeah. And Bernard pulled him into sex and got into seeing. Not my way, but something with the record player. He used to know this story fluently, yeah. And he just, it was awful. And they said, do you want to be in a band? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he said, yeah, like that was what he was doing. Yeah, you know, yeah, I want to be in a band. Yeah, I'll be in a band kind of thing. And became Johnny Rotten. Really fucking great. He was everything. Every, and he met a guy put his foot through the telly. 
because of him. Come on, result, yeah? So it, it, it was such a fantastic time. Um, Johnny Rotten was an amazing guy, and he was perfect for the Sex Pistols, and I think he did a bang-up job all the way through, really. Was there any, um, uh, back then, because, you know, their music was pretty in your face, right? And was there any, were they getting censored at all back then? Yes. Then, yeah, like what, kind, oh. what, what kind of censorship and, like, legal shit was going on with the music? Oh, fucking hell. Look, uh, two words, Mary Whitehouse, yeah? Yeah. That tells you everything. She, you know, she uh, hated them. Yeah. It isn't, it wasn't like it is now. Um, because of all the platforms and global communication, the whole thing with censorship has been revisited. It, 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 it was, um, what's the word? You know, it was, it, everything just seemed so local. And, and I mean, we were coming off. Remember what the goons did, the Kenneth Moore and, and all those kind of people, the innuendo and everything. We were still coming off all that. Mm. You know, I think now you can go on TV and call the queen a cunt and get away <laughs> with it. Right? Not that I'm calling the queen a cunt, but you know, it might've come up. Yeah. We hit on that a little bit, you know, Actually, you're right. England, in inverted commas, doesn't have free speech. America does. Yeah. Okay. But it doesn't matter. Um, there, there are loads of hidden laws in England that they can take action against you for mm-hmm. things that we would consider free speech. I looked into that after that kind of came up with you. Um, America has free speech, but it doesn't mean it's not actionable, as you found out, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what, was Sid, uh, what was Sid like? Yeah. Okay, well, Sid was a really, really close friend of mine. I I mean, I'll tell you the story. Look, um, yeah, (laughs) okay, so I left The Clash, and I I was hanging out with Sid a lot, and he was around on the scene, and he was such a sex pistol, it hurt, but he wasn't. We we all knew each other. All the Johns knew, you know, John Beverly, John Rotten, John Wardle, John Gray. Okay, so Rotten was Rotten. And Sid was John, and John Gray was Gray, and Wobble was the other John. You know what I mean? Okay. Mm. So um, anyway, so doing a lot of hanging out with Sid. Sid was amazing all the way until two thirds of the way through Nancy, when it just all fell apart. Okay. Uh, but Sid was just really interesting um, into all the music. You know, he's come off the Beatles, the Stones, Bowie. Uh, all the things that you would be into, all the pop that was out there. He had a really interesting, it was just so much fun. I taught him bass and I taught him guitar really quickly. And uh, I left the clash and, and we formed a band called Flowers of Romance. And then Malcolm wanted to boot Glenn out the pistols and he wanted to sit. And he said, Keith, I want to sit in the pistols. And there was a school of thought, you cunt, you're just trying to fuck up our band. But I actually said, Sid, you have to do this. Mm. You, you are the sex pistol, you know? And so, yeah, that, that, you know, how can I tell you what Sid was like? You know, he was, he was just, he wasn't the fucking idiot that you saw at the tail end with stupid blood running down his face and all, all that nonsense. That, that was a really unfortunate hard fault that he took due to Nancy and the whole New York infection because I really felt like when the New Yorkers came over and kind of put a few flags down, they also, the whole scene just became, well, it, it was done when it came to what the um, the genesis of the scene was done by then. then. Then it was just, oh, we got this band and we're turning it into that band now and we're all Americans and this whole horrible junk scene came over and then suddenly everyone was living in New York anyway and, you know, I, I believe while that was happening, America was being imported over here to all the neighborhoods and all the kids turned into horrible little drug dealers on bikes and not, you know, you know how drugs can be a cool scene too when, you know, people can be nice and it's not this this horrible scene that possibly you had to resort to. Well, it's, it, I mean... The tra- road to get around, you know. Do you know what? The tra- train spotting always, I've always felt that is the perfect explanation yes. of drugs because it's sh- rather than just showing you the bad because when you grow up right you go to school you have those lessons with the teachers where they bring a policeman in and you watch a video and it's like you watch a video about Leah Betts on uh, drugs and basically if you take drugs you're going to die and you, so you grow up with this yeah. like attitude that all drugs are instant death and blah 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 I think Trey Spoiler did it really well they showed you the good side and then they show you eventually it always goes to shit right it was really just what it was like yeah it just goes to shit. So what the drugs, the, 
you you say the the kind of junk scene was brought in by the Americans. Okay, look, I'm not saying we weren't doing everything and anything. Okay, uh, the reason there are no good drugs left, man, is because we did them all. You know. Um, all right, so Sex Pistols break up. You're friends with Johnny. Yeah, so there was this gig, um, this Clash and Sex Pistol gig at a place called Black Swan, quite a well-known gig. Don't know why, because there weren't that many people there. It's one of those things where everyone says I was there, and if they were, there'd be a million people there, and they weren't because I was there. <laughs> but I, it was my gig before last. I knew I wasn't going to be with them anymore. And he, and he walked in, and he was pissed off and sitting on his own, I mean, completely, and he hated all the pistols at the time. And I said, look, Man, I'm 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 not going to be with them. And he went, fucking good, you know. And I said, now I know this is never going to happen, but but should the pistols ever go wrong or split up, we sh- we have to do something. And he said, yes. And I said, hey, fuck it. Even the pistols don't go wrong. We should do something. But amazingly, I mean, you could talk about a black swan. I mean, really, you, it, you could see it coming, but. You just never would have thought that they wouldn't have existed and Sid would be dead within, like, <laughs> not very long. Yeah. yeah. What, a few months, yeah. I mean, I never saw that coming, that Sex Pistols just kind of uh, exploding and becoming, uh, yeah. Uh, I thought they'd be around for a long time, yeah. I mean, they kind of have been, but well, you know yeah. what I mean? Oh, well, I saw them headline Reading when I was about, I don't know, was I like 20 or something or 15? I can't remember when they reformed. Wow. Yeah, I think they headlined. Um, I'm pretty sure they did, but it just, I don't know, it didn't feel, it didn't feel right. Like the Johnny Rotten I see now, I'd, and then the Johnny Rotten you see on like old YouTube videos, it seems like two different people. Absolutely. And he, and um, he was the new guy. And it just, I don't know, man. It just, it didn't work for me. It, quite magic, really. Um I saw the Pistols at the Nashville in West London for the first time when I saw them. And I was just in West London. And I was with, I can't even remember who now. And it was like, no, we're going now. We're going right now. Let's go and see them now. Where? The Nashville. Oh, it's across the road. Yeah, come on, bang. And as I opened the door, Lydon was on stage and just did this. Thing. So the first time I saw him, I was looking at him and he was just doing the most punk sex Pistols thing. They, they used to do this tune at the beginning that was just, nothing they just make a load of noise and they just yell and then the gig started and they they were at that stage where they were doing really well-known sex pistol tunes and it was just so fucking cathartic it was just like yes you know i don't know what it was right but we all knew what it was yeah Mm. and uh it was magical um so what was it like doing public image with him well, uh, quite, you see, on the way in, r- really good. Um, I mean, the first thing I asked him to do was stop calling himself Johnny Rotten, okay? And uh, he got his head behind that. He got that. Mm. The next thing, which is a little bit Bitcoiny of me, we're not a band, we're a company. We're the fucking company. Let's be a communications company. One of the things we do is music. Okay. Um, that makes sense. Video, video was like big tech then. You know, I remember walking around with really, really big, horrible reel to reel decks doing black and white video with my friend Ken Lockie and what have you in those days, 78, 79. And then I remember maybe in 80, I had this thing over my shoulder that was a picture search VHS thing. It was, you know, so, you know, video was big then. There was no interview, there was no nothing. You know, not everyone had a camera. Not everyone even imagined they'd ever have a camera on them that did what 4K. You could be calling 4K now. It's insane, isn't it? Mm. It's also it's also made it all become all noise and no signal and very obsolete. You know what the thing you had then was focus. That if we were going to be somewhere, everyone was going to be watching it at the same time and having the same experience. You've had that, Peter. So the next yeah. time you go in, it's like, did you see it? Oh, no, I missed it. And if you missed it, you missed it. You know, so it was all so different. So actually, more low time preference in a way, but not unwittingly, you know. So, yeah, public image, he, he becomes Johnny Lyden. We're not a band, we're a company. We get Wobble, who had never played in a band before, but was just, there was no one like him. I don't know if you're aware of him. And we had this crazy Canadian drummer who, like, we had all these guys lined up on the stairs, yeah, because everyone wants to be in pill. Of course they did. 
you know. And it was like someone came in, no, 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 no. Okay, and this guy came in, bam, 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 yeah, that's it. We And he went, well, we haven't even played a record. And I said, we don't need to. You're the guy. And he was. So anyway, that's John. John was really great through the first and second pill records. And then it all started getting a bit um, complicated anyway. And time had changed anyway. It wasn't about punk. It was about post-punk and, and propagation of, uh, I don't know what the fuck it was I was trying to do. But yeah. I, you know, what do you what do what do you think of music now? Like, is there any any artists you Sanit- like now? Sanitized, watered down, and ruined. And most of the stuff I listen to, again, not oh, I only listen to this. Okay, uh, you know, I've got a lot of time for uh, D twelve and or well, Doctor Dre in general. You know, I, I mean, I appreciate where they're coming from, but I, I just find, uh, you know, I just find it. It's fear. It's sanitized, walked down, ruined, and sold back to us. And, you know, we're stupid enough to buy it. So there's you nothing, know, there's I, no, like, recent artists, anything you like? When it comes to recent artists, I can't come up with anyone. Yeah. Okay, if, if you start talking about odd classical dudes or weird, yeah, you know, like, there's, I, I, I'm into a lot of music. I, I practice all the time, and I make music. But, yeah, no, I can't think of anything exciting. Uh, you know, tribute bands became the norm. <laughs> Um, I do, I'm very bullish about, we're just about to hit a landscape that's going to be the cipher version of what happened. This is the time, mm. but instead of, it, instead of it being in England, it's global. I mean, what I had in England was nothing. Okay. And what came from that the, was the only thing that could be leveraged, right? And the best, rails to go through was music now music isn't center stage anymore but it really was then do you do you believe that peter that music isn't really center stage anymore Mm. the problem is everything's just become kind of all merged like there are people out there who are they they have kind of like multiple careers They're, they're a musician an actor and an opinion leader right and everything's just like a little bit shiny like I grew up as a like into the hardcore metal, right? So I was like tail end of Cro Mags and sick of it all, kind of biohazard. But I was also into like Faith No More and Soundgarden and stuff okay. like that. And you know, I, and I'm I'm also right now I'm actually making a four part documentary about a heavy metal band called The Ghost Inside. They had this bus crash four years ago, five years ago. The driver died. The drummer lost his leg. Like it's it's like a terrible story. And they took four years and they got back right. But in doing that, I've been finding out the story, and they, they were saying, look, we'd turn up at shows and maybe 10 to 15 kids there. But if they liked us, next time we might have 25. And they just really, really worked hard for years to build this band. They never sold out. They signed a deal with Epitaph. Epitaph gave them free reign. When all the hardcore metal started adding the melodic singing, they didn't really do it. And I was like, like this is proper. You know, There's no overnight success here. This is proper hard work. And I look at the current music and I, I, I try and see what's coming out that I really like. And this like almost nothing. I, I say to a lot of people, I think the last great album, genuine great album that would make any top 10 album or top 50 album all time was Amy Winehouse. I think she made the last great album. Okay. I think she's got the greatest voice and, and she was great. And it's such a drag where she was at, what yeah. happened to her, the people that were around her. But I, I'm sorry, I remember sitting in Prague for a few years and they play Amy Winehouse in this place I went to eat all the time. <laughs> and I think her voice is just a bollocks, but her, that shit they play behind her, that ding, 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 ding. I mean, just rinky tink, fucking bollocks. Oh, I like uh, it. I mean, uh, the odd tune is, is undeniably just cool, but still, I just think, oh man, if they just like, add a 10% layer extra in the music with a little bit of something, she just would have been astounding. I mean, she was astounding anyway, mm. but she wasn't realised. I couldn't do anything about it at the time because I was too, I was too fucked anyway. Well, you you, know, but uh, you might be right. Like, as, as everything crashes and burns now, this might see the right... Like, there's going to be a bunch of people who can't get jobs or don't want to get jobs. It might be the time that we get, like, this another wave of punk. Like, I really like this band, The Gallows. They, they were... Their first album was a proper kind of fuck you in your face. Uh, I saw them, my first time I saw them, they played at the, I think it's like King's College or something in London. I ended up seeing them about 10 times in yeah, yeah. in a couple of years. And they kind of came on with a proper attitude of, fuck you, this is how we think. 
you know, bollocks to everyone. And I really like them. They, they survived two albums and split up, which is really sad. Um, I don't know. Uh, th- this kind of makes them scarce. We know that scarcity, don't we? Yeah. I still listen so, to their albums. I still, especially yeah. the first one, they uh, orchestra of wolves. I still listen to that. Funny enough, I go into London to get my tattoos. I go to uh Frist street tattoo and I go in there one day and the singer Frank Carter is there. turns out he started doing tattoos now. Um, he's got another band now, Frank Carter and the rattlesnakes. Um, He's an interesting dude, but but I just don't. There's not. There's very little music that interests me now. The kids play me. Will play me something. Like they'll be into something like. like my son likes this band Brockhampton, a kind of rock uh, rap band, and they're, they're like, yeah, yeah. What's the other one actually? I do like Twenty One Pilots. I think are kind of interesting. I don't like all their stuff, but I think they're kind of yeah. interesting. But but you're really trying hard to find that, aren't you? Yeah, what? you're like. Oh, there's one that, you know. And it's a song, right, Keith? Like, I hear a song and then I'll go and check out the album. I'm like, oh, this is just junk. I just, I just don't, I don't like this. I, I, White Stripes, I really miss the White Stripes. Yeah, they were one of yeah, the last they great were bands. Great, they had that thing as well. Yeah. They had that thing. Like, they were both individually interesting and they were very clever the way they leveraged themselves. And I know they were all just so in, in the right place and everything, but they were in the right place. I yeah. love them on coffee and cigarettes. You've seen them on coffee and cigarettes, man. Yeah. I, you know? I, I actually saw them play in London before they before they kind of stopped touring, and and it was one of the better shows I've been to. But we did have some bands like that. We had um, Wolf Mother. I was really into Wolf Mother when they came out. There's actually there's quite a bit I like about Oasis at certain times. I, you know, oh shit! Listen, uh, listen. If you're gonna be a pop star, be them. Yeah. You know, if, if you're gonna copy the Beatles, do it like they did it, you know, fucking copy them and bring out the best you can possibly bring out because you're so fucking genuinely into it. I'll give you a band from today that is cool. They're not trying for hit singles, okay? Girl band are the only game in town. I've seen them live, and it was the most futuristic being now and the future I'd be fucking waiting for. The way (laughs) it's impossible to describe them, okay, Man, they've got elements of everything you love. What are they called, sorry? Girl Band. Girl Band. Right, I'm, I'm going to check them out. Um, check them out. Uh, kind of weird, you know. You know, you might end up checking them out with me and I'll drag you to one of their shows. No, um, I'll go. Just let me know when they're playing, man. Next up, I talk to Keith more about Bitcoin and punk. But before that, I've got a message from my amazing sponsors. So first up, let's talk about Kraken, the mighty Kraken, the best place for buying and selling Bitcoin. Firstly, they have world-class security. They are the most trusted cryptocurrency exchange in the market. No hacker is going to get their hands on your Bitcoin. And with their 24-7, 365 customer support, they can help you out with any issues, whoever you are and wherever you are. They have the most comprehensive suite of tools for trading Bitcoin. At Kraken.com, it could not be easier to sign up, buy and sell Bitcoin. They also have a beautiful mobile-first app. So if you're on the go and you're thinking, I want some more Bitcoin, you can do it with their mobile app. With their margin trading futures and OTC desk, Kraken has every option covered for you. There is no better place to trade Bitcoin. Find out more at kraken.com or download the app. That's available for the iPhone and Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. Also, let's talk about BlockFi, the future of Bitcoin and financial services. With BlockFi, you can open up an interest account and earn money on your Bitcoin Also, using your Bitcoin as collateral, you can take out a USD loan. They also now have an amazing mobile app. You can transfer directly from a crypto wallet into your BlockFi account. And also, I've been talking to the team. They've got so much cool stuff coming out this year. And I will be keeping you updated on this. If you are interested in checking out BlockFi, I do recommend you do your own research. And then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. All right, so the next thing I want to know is like, when you messaged me, I was like, fucking hell, Keith Levine, that's mental. And then I'm like, but it's so, it makes so much sense, right? It's not, it's this punk, cypherpunk thing, Bitcoin thing. And it's, it's a chance to like, it's a chance to stick two fingers up and exit the system, right? So, but, I, and I don't often ask people this anymore because I don't usually care. Most people told this story, but actually I want to know with you, tell me your like, your Bitcoin moment like when you discovered it because obviously you were red pilled in 1976 right or 1974 whatever but, yeah but tell me your bitcoin yeah. moment and you were like aha moment oh okay Look, i'll tell you the moment where i fucked it in 2011 because some other stuff came up and it was kind of hard you know it was a silk road kind of uh, bitcoin awareness thing i looked into it and I thought 
I have to look at that. Fuck it. Big mistake in a way. Yeah, if you want to be um, luckily wealthy. Everyone Um, did that. Yeah, okay. So I did what you did, right? I I, I ended up back in there in 2017. Okay, with so you got blockchain, not Bitcoin. So uh, I went all around the world to get back to Bitcoin. I did start at Bitcoin. God, I'm gonna fucking out it via BitConnect for like a few days. <laughs> okay, <laughs> realized there's no free lunch in crypto, and that just motivated. It's not because I wanted my pound of flesh. It's just I just thought I'm gonna learn about this property now. Stop fucking about, and. Just like Max Kaiser says, it was like it was like this thing hit me and just decoded everything. It decoded me. It it, it it confirmed certain things in the world. When I was watching, of all people, Don Tapscott explaining Bitcoin, I suddenly grabbed Kate and went, "Kate, this isn't about money. This could solve world famine. This is the best fucking thing." And I, I know it works. I know it's true. Okay. Um, and then I started looking into, you know, the algorithm, the hashing algorithm, and just just the whole setup. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin is a real learning curve. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, we both know if you're talking to someone in Zimbabwe or Venezuela, it's not why, it's like how. <laughs> you know, how the fuck can I get this? Uh, if you're talking to someone here, it's like I don't want to know about bitcoin because i don't need bitcoin mm. or when do, how do i get in you know how do you say bitcoin isn't a company bitcoin is a, it's a oh it's a decentralized autonomous organization you know it's like they're gone they're gone they're long gone don't it i mean we're resolving to not even say the b word now aren't we everyone's not saying the b word and i think really it, it, it's a good narrative because it, nobody you know you guys pointed this out this came off of what Bitcoin did for me, but I was onto it anyway. Nobody addresses the fucking money. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so you see these people and they're kind of debating. And it's like, like I said, the gold Bitcoin debate. Wait a minute. Let's talk about the same thing. Well, okay? but yeah. And, uh, I mean, that was my thing with the uh, Rogan and Brett Weinstein show. When I was listening to that, I was like, yep, tick, yep, tick. Okay. Talk about the money. Talk about them. And they didn't. He did it with John Stewart a couple of weeks later, which was great. But I was like, talk about the money. Talk about the fucking money. And they, they don't always do that. And Sometimes you, they want to solve bad politics with more politics, and it's like, hold on. Yeah, yeah, no, and, but they, but, and they're the ones saying it's not working anyway, but you'd think Rogan, right, would fucking know about money. But then when you start finding out traders don't know how money works, they know how to trade, and yeah. you start finding out everyone in the bank doesn't know how money works, and it becomes just – so for me, it's the unbelievable truth. And I could believe it easily because, like you said, yeah, I was red-pilled pretty much on the way into the world, you know. Um, it just always was that way. When I was 11 at school, I'll never forget um, the headmaster's son going, Louis, you know what your problem is? You're antisocial. And and I, I've never forgotten it, as you can tell. Yeah. Uh, that was when I was 11. I was 63, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. And I can see. You're still fucking antisocial. Yeah, and I'm not. You know, uh, I'm just a, a nice guy that wants to fix the world. And now I'm so fucking bullish because there is a tool where you don't have to smash things down. You just navigate around things and just keep yourself to yourself and get on with it. And that's a silent protest. Well, you know, like uh, we, we all protest. know, you, me know, because we're Bitcoiners and th- therefore we've become kind of quasi macroeconomists and what have you. We know every fucking war out there is about money. We know, you know, Iran, Libya, oh, it was about putting the central bank in. We know that, okay? And you can start going back and just saying, oh, look, Abraham Lincoln got shot. Oh, look, President Kennedy got shot. Oh, Pearl Harbor. Oh, 9 11, you know, oh, how fucking convenient, you know? Um, and I just fucking had enough. When I saw 9-11, I said, this ain't happening. They're making this happen. Okay. The, the, I, I said the World Trade Centers were slated for demolition anyway because some IRA activity. Okay. And this it was all about Building 7 anyway. And, you know, this is the biggest fucking fiasco in plain sight I've seen. And loads of me. So you, so you think, you think, who do you think to, to took down the World Trade Center? I, it's really neither here nor there. I, well, I think America took down the World Trade Center. That's See, I, do you know what? I, I've, I've read all the conspiracy stuff. And, and I thought the a lot of the stuff happened, doesn't. I thought that. Well, but the, 
the stuff that doesn't make sense when I've looked into it is like, hold on, these guys were training on like Cessnas. Yeah. And then you can fly a jet into the Pentagon. You can like, was it that corkscrew turn the guy does and land into the Pentagon? Like, it seems really hard what, what they managed to do and to coordinate it. But at the same time, I'm like, how, if it is a conspiracy, Surely there's somebody who who knows who would come out and say I don't know I really struggle with Lots knowing what it is. Lots of people who knew came out. Lots of people knew who knew have have come out. I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to name names. Mm. Um, but what? Let me let me ask you this, right? Yeah. If you wanted to feel safe, what do you think would be the most secure place in the world just to be hanging out, drinking coffee, because you wanted to feel safe? Um, I would th- I would want to be in South Chile. Or New Zealand, or yeah, Peter. Okay, stick with the conversation, man. The fucking Pentagon. You'd hang out at the Pentagon, <laughs> wouldn't you? Okay. How the fuck does anything get close, close to the Pentagon? Why were helicopters not deployed? You know, when, what I really mean is, show me the F-11s. Like nothing gets into New York airspace by mistake. Bollocks. I mean, I, that's, I said it at the time. Okay, uh, I, I don't even care. certainly looks like it. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, very convenient, perfectly targeted, you know, Bin Laden. And, uh, you know, if I said uh, a candidate for somebody playing Jesus in a movie, okay, this would have been in the 90s, I would have said Osama Bin Laden, you know. Listen, man, I, n- I know you try and be objective and you do research things, okay. And if you did research this, I- I'm sure you might come up with something quite similar. And, and the thing well, I, I like most of these things when I research them, I come up with like two sides of an argument. <laughs> I can never like, never like pin it down. I'm like, okay, I can see the argument for why for the conspiracy theories. I can see the argument against it. I really struggle. I, I, I often struggle with it, but I just feel like, really, would, it, would would America really attack itself? I know a lot of people listen and go, "Well, of course they fucking would," but I'm just like, really, <laughs> dude, Man. dude, have you read? Do- have you read Web of Debt? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't actually read, read it. Okay, now. Um, now, I'm sure you've read a good few things. That I mean, this has been going on a long, long time. I okay, know. it's been going on a long, long time. I, I, I think that you know Woodrow Wilson polarizes one area, but if you go back a little bit further, uh, you, you know, I think Abraham Lincoln is the poster boy to the way America works. Uh, I think Alan Brown said the other day, talking on something. Um, they said, yeah, oh, well, you know, probably with, uh, with Trump, they probably just sat him down and showed him a few movies of President Kennedy being assassinated and what have you. He didn't particularly dictate any policy, but that would have been the Fed talking to uh, Trump, you know. So I mean, it's just the way it works. It's just the way it works, you know. It's definitely fucked up, man. All right, so listen, how, how deep are you in the Bitcoin stuff? Like, how deep have you gone technically with it? Like, no, oh, no, I can never go deep enough. I always wish I knew. I wish I knew Jimmy Song and a couple of guys like that, so they they can just say, "Stop asking this question, Keith. Go away and do this. Come back when you know how it works, and I'll tell you what to do next." Kind of thing. Yeah, uh, I'm prepared to do that, and I, I find it I find it um, quite difficult using a CLI and what have you, but. I think it's essential. I'm, I'm putting together a my node at the moment after my experience with Casa, which um, is understandable experience. Um, so I'm run. Yeah. So there's your answer. I mean, I'm running a fucking node. I've got hardware wallets, that kind of thing. I mean, I haven't got any Bitcoin, of course. You know, but the, the thing is, is I want to teach people how to how to use this shit, and I've got the time and the patience. And uh, I, what do you mean you don't have any Bitcoin? Well, that's the party you line. Love that's that. the party line at the moment. I mean, yeah, I know. I haven't got, I haven't got any Bitcoin. Before. No, man. You know, I mean, fuck. You blew all yours in that bet, didn't you? And I know that's gone. <laughs> so, listen, <laughs> listen. We want to get Trump reelected, which we don't. We should get him to free Ross Ulbricht. And uh, well, that would be great, but that wouldn't he? I mean, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could leverage him to do that? He might. Wouldn't it be great? But, yeah. I'd love Ross Ulbricht to get. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, kind of viral. I, I don't. I don't. Something. I don't think you see that happening under Trump, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, surprising. Yeah, I guess that's a whole another conversation, you know. Because, uh, well, I, I mean, it, it, it plays. Uh, do you think Trump understands Bitcoin or gives a fuck about it or knows about it or anything? 
I think he knows a bit about it. He doesn't give a fuck about it and definitely doesn't understand it. And uh, if someone like Mnuchin is in his ear or the Feder in his ear saying this is too much of a risk, you need to get rid of it, I think he would have to question it. But I don't think he would ever give a fuck about about it. I do you think, think, do you think Mnuchin would? Or, or do you think they just see it as this spec on the financial horizon because it, it's got nothing, is a nothing market cap? Yeah, I don't think they're worried about it as a competition for the US dollar. I just think they're more kind of worried about it as a tool for money laundering and terrorists, blah, 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 the same old no, uh, that, blood bullshit. But that's what they, I think that's. That, no, that's what they say. You know, remember, that's the first narrative you have to break yeah, yeah. With, with people. Look, you know. Oh, no, I don't agree with it. But what I'm saying is, I think that's what they probably, they more care whether it's being used. I don't think they see it as a threat to the financial system at the moment. They're probably going, come on, you can't take over the US dollar. So. Pisa from what Bitcoin did, do you see it as a threat to the financial global economy or the, the global currency? Do you see it as a threat to the dollar? I see uh, the US dollar as a threat to humans and therefore Absolutely. we need Bitcoin. Absolutely. No, I, I see it that way too. Uh, I, I, I think a, a good narrative would be, look, um, you know. Get- a threat, because when, when you describe Bitcoin as a threat, it, like even though I said it, it's, it, you kind of paint it as this kind of dangerous thing. I actually think it's it's more of a uh, it's more of a cure. Yeah, no, it, it's a cure. It's there. It's never been there before, and there's two problems. One is getting people to believe it, and and, and the other one is that people <laughs> people don't know what money is. We didn't, okay. And now when you do, and you start. You know, when you're, th- when I think about money now, I think about energy and time, you know, and uh, when, when I, I do deals with people and what have you, I save them all money by saying, no, no, if we do this and this, then that cancels that out. You know, the last thing you want to do is be exchanging these coupons. Uh, is, I, I'm bereft of, or, is, what's the word? Uh, I don't know fucking anyone that is a Bitcoiner, that I didn't make a Bitcoiner. So, you know, I, I'm having real problems with getting people, with getting income in Bitcoin, you know. Um, it's hard to red pill people, man. Yeah. I've been trying, dude. Like for months on, like for my friends, I've been showing them uh, the kind of like 10-year yields heading towards zero. Yeah, yeah. Posting videos of people talking about the money printing, showing, look, we're economic crashes. We're heading to an economic crash, yet the stock market's rising. Like I'm showing people all these things. They're like, don't care. They don't care. They don't so care. what's going to happen yeah. is, the, the, you know, where, where you talked about it being natural to people like in Venezuela or as in Babwe, I think even Turkey, oh, Iran, yeah, yeah. Argentina, it's they just get it, right? Yeah. I think the reckoning is coming for people in, in uh, more kind of s- stable Western nations where they, they're going, to, their day of reckoning is coming and then they're going to realize. I think that's coming, man, but... Yeah, yeah, it's man, kind of funny times. everywhere. I think a number of currencies are, are going to suddenly go to zero. And, uh, but it's so weird. With that happening, it makes the dollar stronger. And there, there are certain old school people in the macro economy, and I hear their views on it. And they're like, no, no, they, they can do what they like. You know, they can collapse this economy and they can keep it going. It depends what they choose to do. It depends, you know, and remember, these guys think in 30 year cycles, you know not three month cycles or a year, you know, COVID is, is it a six month thing? Is it a two year thing? Are they going to, is it a psyop that's going to last 10 years? Oh, it's back on again. Oh, it's awful. Very handy to be able to have a really good, uh, a political enemy, an enemy just like Bitcoin that doesn't care. Bitcoin doesn't care. Bitcoin is, is a moral, a political, a everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, some, I had an argument with someone recently about, about this and they were saying, no, Bitcoin is political. <laughs> well, uh, how is that I was like, possible? what? Uh, I was like, no, it's not. It's not. And they're like, yes, it is. It's libertarian. I was like, no, it's not. It, it might have like alignments with libertarians and it might have, uh, a, you know, even Satoshi might have been a libertarian himself, but I'm saying it isn't political. It is a no, piece no, it of isn't. software. It's just a tool. Um, yeah. and, and the other thing that, that is really difficult, and I get that it's difficult because, I mean, I wanted to... I was red pilled anyway. So all I wanted was it to fall into place and, and everything Bitcoin ever does just makes me feel better about it. The more I understand about Bitcoin, the better I feel about it. The more I want to uh, just get it to people. Um, I don't care about these guys doing the kind of old school custodial or it can be non-custodial in the future, all that stuff. Um, 
you know, I, I, I'm looking for a hardcore layer of millennials that have been fucked, okay, and the Zs, and you who have been fucked. I mean, you're a very pragmatic person, but essentially all your mates in the pub that see you as the Bitcoin guy and don't give a fuck because... They think I'm a weirdo. Do they, though? I mean, you are, anyway. Yeah, but that's probably, like, that's probably like what happened with you, like, in, in your school and when you were leaving, like, well, that guy said you're antisocial and when you're a punk. You're yeah, probably like, ah... Oh. You know, Levine's that weird guy in the punk band, right? They probably, that's probably what they thought. And they're the me. They're that piece that weird guy going on about Bitcoin and the collapsing economy. And they're sitting there having a beer talking about girls and football. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, but, but the, the world economy is going to crash. You need Bitcoin. They're like, shut up, Pete. Fuck sake. Yeah. Up. You and, and then shut you want to say, look, dudes, if you just put 10% of the time you put into football, into Bitcoin, and, and just like, just, you know, uh, it's like, you know, Marty Bent, uh, somebody was saying something to him. And it was like, oh, I don't get it. I don't understand. He, he went, yeah, but you know more about Bitcoin than you did on Monday, don't you? And he went, actually, yeah. And he, and he went, and you will know more in two weeks. You know, and you know, Good point, man. this whole thing, you know, just learn slowly. It's a language. And money is an instant language. You know, the way we understood money was it's this simple. This thing does that. Bang. Great. And mm -hmm. it's quite difficult to get hold of. And people get very emotional about it. There's, what is so fantastic about Bitcoin. Remember, Bitcoin isn't anything. But it, it allows you to approach the whole situation of transaction exchange, understanding value, okay, and this whole fucking uh, extortion thing that has gone along with money. It's just out of the picture. Um, just to get people to understand the difference between trustless and trusted, you know, they don't even realize who they've been trusting. Mm -hmm. And and, yeah. and well, it's a concept, trustless and scarcity. Add scarcity. And scarcity. And it's taken me fucking three years to really. Re I mean, I got it, but to assimilate it and really understand that. And what I found with Bitcoin is, the more you understand about Bitcoin, the more you can apply it to everything in the world, everything. So, uh, you, you know, you're going to start learning more about history and you're going to be reading it and understanding the history better because you fucking understand the game theory of it. It's insane, yeah? Uh, mm. You know, so it, it's a really cool thing. It opens you up to history, game theory, a balance of how it really is. It teaches you what money really is and only everything is about money. That's why I'm like, oh, was it hard? going online and reading the white paper that you didn't get. You know, I don't get the fucking white paper. I mean, I get the first bit, but when it goes to the bits that Andreas Antonopoulos gets, it's like, he goes and writes a book about it. And I'm like, yeah. dude, you know, you know, I'm the fucking same. I don't get that shit. No, man. And it's like, <laughs> if I want to turn someone on a Bitcoin, the last thing I'm going to do is say, read the white paper. You know, if I want to turn someone off Bitcoin, read the white paper, you know, go. As, yeah. So, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah, read the white paper, and then you'll you'll fundamentally understand. Like, come on, get a grip. <laughs> no, when, I'm with you, bro. When people say, "Oh, Keith, you know you're the Bitcoin guy," you know because you know what happens. They come up to you when yeah, there's yeah. a bull run or there's a little bit of um, hype, a bit of fud going on. So, um, you know, I, is it too late to get in? Should I do this? Should I do that? Uh, you know, yeah. And how much? Yeah, how much money can I make? Um, and I'm like, look, I, I think it's quite something to know about Bitcoin and you can benefit by Bit from Bitcoin by not buying any. I think the first thing you should do is find out about Bitcoin and don't buy any unless you've got some spare money. Um, and this is financial advice. If you've got spare money, buy some fucking Bitcoin while you can get it. Um, mm -hmm. All these guys, this is not financial advice. What the fuck else is it, man? Of course it's financial <laughs> advice, you know? Um, yeah, but we're talking about real money here. To understand the difference between real money. Now, the thing uh, Robert Reed loved just recently, Money and Slaves, yeah, those little pyramids. Yeah, the, the fiat pyramids and then the pyramid of Bitcoin. I, I saw somebody on Twitter saying, yeah, well, you know, early adopters were rewarded more. It's a pyramid scheme, man. Yeah, it's a pyramid scheme of fucking hard money. Every layer is hard money. Okay? So you know how it works. If someone doesn't Dude, you're, work, you're, you're more hardcore Bitcoin than me. Listen to you. In, in a way, in a way, listen, man, you've done something. You, you are, I mean, you're you, man. But the thing is, uh, you've done so much. Believe me, you're hardcore. You're all in Bitcoin, man. And, you know, um, yeah. I mean, we can't all be onboarded with our platinum chasms. Right. Uh, no, res Fuck off. no, listen, bro, respect. <laughs> I saw you do the yeah. one Bitcoin bet and create that multi-sig over the air 
And like, yeah. I wanted to jump in there. <laughs> Pete, I wanted to jump in and say, hey, hey, listen, because you're like, should we do a test then? And I'm like, yeah, do a test then, do a test then, yeah? And they're like, hey, live a little. It's all right for fucking them. You know, big comments <laughs> in 2011 saying live a little, you know, but you did it, you know. Yeah, I did it, man. Respect, bro. That was, that was, that was cool. And uh, I'm with you all the way on the bet. I hope you win. Well, it's a weird one. I mean, oh. what made you do it? What made you say it? I just wanted to get the conversation going. I wanted some skin in the game for the election and, and just just have some interest about it. Um, a letter of intent, baby. Yeah. Y- yeah. And um, But the thing is, it's, uh, some people are like, oh, I always knew you were fucking liberal. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm not. I, I wouldn't vote for Joe Biden. Fuck that. Um, but <laughs> I also think Trump's a moron. Uh, I think they're all morons, to be honest. But... I don't know. I just thought it would be a bit of fun. It's done now. Hopefully, I'm going to hang out with Hoddle when on the evening of the yeah, election. We'll watch it. It'll be interesting. Yeah. And and whoever wins, the world is still going to continue to burn. It's not like they these are some quite great hope. They're going to change yeah, the world. No, they're just more just of the a, same bullshit. No, it's good. Good. Good Bitcoin action, and it's a thing. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, like you said, yeah. I mean, look, these guys. Uh, I'm, not, I'm talking about Trump and the politicians. They're all bought and paid for, and you know, uh, not. You don't, they just don't want certain things to happen on their watch. You know the story. Yeah. So they've got no, um, you know, they've, they've got no, what's the word? Motivation to really give a fuck yeah. about anything about, except that, I mean, Trump's big on legacy. Trump likes his name everywhere. He wants a wall with his name on. I mean, there's a lot of buildings that say Trump lives that he's just branded. You know, the building said, you, you know, or he's bought his name on it. You know, uh, <laughs> you know. It was interesting to hear you talking to. I can't remember who was saying how Trump was brought up and and everything. Uh, do you remember that? Was it? You? Well, he's got. Uh, yeah, I think that was June Seth. Yeah, yeah. He's brought. And there's a book about how about that. There's some, clearly, some weird shit going on there, man. But um, you know, yeah. I mean, America. I mean, look, America's an amazing place, but it's, it's so weird as well. You know, um, mm. yeah, I mean, Trump just got lucky in the early 70s. You know, he's a dickhead. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that he can be president, what does that tell us? What does that tell us? I mean, it's just confirmation of just yeah. what absolute bollocks it all is. And and the thing is, that really, I, I mean, I'm a boomer, but obviously I don't. I mean, I, I'm a boomer through and through, you know, but I'm not the most punk boomer. Yeah, punk boomer. You know, I'm not sitting on fucking, you, you know, 21 Bitcoin or I'm not sitting on, look at the guys in the clash. They've all got loads of fucking money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, so what? Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not phoning them up saying, well, get into Bitcoin. I mean, half of them are dead anyway. I mean, but, um, well, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, this is about the fucking millennials and, and the guys, feeding into them and the guys after the millennium mm-hmm. you know when bitcoin does what we, we're imagining we'll be dead yeah and my kids like a fucked up world they're going into now i mean i do worry about them but yeah, that's why i teach them about bitcoin man well that's the thing i was so that thing the whole thing about you know get them early you know i mean i'll be being as bad as them we're not indoctrinating them we're just giving them an option everything with this whole government policy scheme was never opt-in. Now, I was born with a number stamped to me. You know, it might as well have been a barcode. I'm a fucking economical unit. You all are. Everyone out there is an economical unit of one form or another, and you're all getting fucked by fiat fucking <laughs> valueless society. And that Hey, but part- listen, look, my, my son gets it right. So, like, like, the news will be on, and there'll be something to do with, like, QE, or yeah. we'll be in the car, and they'll be talking about, oh, the government is going to spend $100 billion on X. And my boys now turn around to me and go, Dad, that's bad, isn't it? I'm like, well, you know, they're doing it for X reason, uh, you know, stagnant economy, but this is the impact of what's going to happen, which nobody's talking about. This is how we all pay for it. And he's... He's kind of red pilled. My son's been red pilled. Cool, man. And and like, I'd love to have been seven or eleven in the car with my dad and, and talking about what was going on because it was all coming. What was just about to come with these three day weeks and all these unions kicking off? They were right, you know. But they were trying to propagate an antiquated thing. It's like this thing with oil. You know, why so everyone's so obsessed with oil? Just fucking drop it and go electric. You know. 
Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I do go off. I do go off, don't I? Yeah. Uh, it's, listen, it's great, and it's it's great talking to you. Uh, I love talking to you about Bitcoin. Um, I'm glad we've become friends when this lockdown ends and the like properly ends, and we actually have concerts. Yeah, we do. Got to go and some. We, we go and watch someone. Yeah, we'll watch a, we do something. We'll go and watch some punk in London, man. But I've really appreciated like getting to know you. Listen, Keith. So, like, if people want to follow you, get in touch. Where can they get hold of you, man? We got a brand new Twitter account at Real Bitcoin Granny. There's no tweets on it, and uh, I haven't really put the real profile in yet. But um, yeah, I'm open to DMs, or uh, don't bother tweeting me. I, I've, I've had a weird history with Twitter. I like I like Bitcoin Twitter. I love the people on there, but I'm I'm still very very PTSD from something I, I've been through for four years. So I created right. the account just as a central place that if if anyone did want to reach out yeah at real bitcoin granny cool man well listen look i i tell people they should go and check out the early punk they should definitely check out early clash they could they should definitely go and check out public image limited See, what I'd say is start a, you know fuck those bands right just make a band and go out there and, f- and fuck it up but the thing is a band these days isn't just music like you said it's, mm. it's artwork it's a business okay it's a brand it's everything that's what we did then and that's maybe what was the most disruptive thing was we took all the elements and said listen we're the ones making the stuff you know we can do this even if um so that meant if i wanted an art director i'd bring him in you know i it wouldn't be theirs it would be ours you know and i I was just kind of trying to own a situation that was just being taken by everybody based on some model from uh bean crosby or the you know the rat pack you know the 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 music business model was still come back when you're black you know um you, you know, uh, we give you 1% kid, like the Beatles got a farthing platoon or something on, on their first two massive albums, you know, I mean, that all got settled, but I was just saying, uh, it was a lot to fight through and it was a lot like the central banks of, uh, the music business. And, and it still is, look at it. It's a corporate wall, you mm-hmm. know, the voice, uh, you know, I, I say it, si- Simon fucking cow. You know, I remember, I remember Simon was an office boy. <laughs> And I knew he was going to make it. He, I think he was an office boy for Pete Waterman. And uh, look at him. I mean, it's just insane. Look mm. at the good he could do. And look and at the what junk he, he turns out. Yeah, and it's all fiat, man. And once you get your head around, I mean, it's not really fiat. I'm just using fiat for fake or watered down, sanitized, ruined, you know. But when you look at everything, all high time preference, you know, McDonald's, Starbucks, all the people I don't want to mention, I don't want to advertise them, fuck them all. Okay, but everything, okay, yeah, it's great doing things that save you time because, as we know, time is of the essence. Yeah, if you say time is money, no, money is time. Okay, and we, we know that. Um, I'm, I'm going to shut up because I'll just babble on for ages. All right, well, listen, look, go start a fucking punk band, people. If you like That's, this, go start a yeah, punk band. Yeah, yeah, go and start, go and start something of your own. Okay, yeah. you have got nothing to lose. Do it with Bitcoin, and you've got everything to gain. Awesome, man. I right, love you, bro. You take yeah, care. Man. Let's love stay in too, touch. Man. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll chat to you soon. And once uh, the gigs are going, we're going to get out. We're going to go and uh, we're going to watch something. Okay, bro. Make that look good. Clean it up. <laughs> It'll be great, man. Take All care. Right. Say goodbye to Kate for me. See you soon, okay. man. All right, man. All right. So what do you make of that one? Keith is fucking awesome, right? When he reached out to me, I was pretty blown away that he listened to the show. And obviously, I did not want to miss the chance to interview him. And I wasn't even sure how deep we would go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. But Keith is a massive Bitcoiner. And to be honest, I was a bit surprised. He totally gets it. He's one of us. He's properly one of us. And he's just a legend. I mean, if you don't know The Clash, come on, go and check them out. You need to go and listen to some of the especially early days of The Clash. So thank you, Keith, for getting in touch and coming on the show. Really good to talk music with you and Bitcoin with you. Hopefully we're going to hang out soon, go to a gig, hopefully a punk gig, have a beer and properly catch up. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to support it, there's loads you can do. It's all up on my website. Just head over to whatbitcoindid.com, click on the support section. Also, if you haven't checked out my other show, Defiance, please do go and check that out. That's at defiance.news. Loads of cool stuff up on there right now. Outside of that, if you want to reach out to me, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And yeah, have a great week and I will see you all soon.